I have no idea. I see here. <laughs> Let me go ask her. thing on what? Up here? Uh, no? Wait. Are you going to sit up here? Maybe I will. I don't know, probably until after our song, and then I'll go down and sit.
Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at St. Andrew's United Methodist Church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And greetings in the name of Jesus Christ to all who are following us on Facebook or YouTube. God bless all of you. Let me invite our candle lighters to come up and get our Advent candle lit for this morning. Good morning. A check in person is coming the way. Sometimes when we are trying something new, or when we are facing a difficult decision, or when we want to celebrate something, or when we just feel lost and alone and uncertain about life the universe and everything, we need a blessing. We don't always think of it that way or word it that way. We say we need advice or support or companions or someone to come along beside and lift us up again so we can see more than the tops of our shoes. We seek a blessing. For many of us, we go home, we talk to parents or brothers and sisters, close friends, those who grew up with us, those who know us best. We want them alongside. We want to be in their presence. Somehow, we know that being there, being home, will make it all things better. Maybe it won't be fixed or solved, or wish the way, but at least we won't be alone. We seek a blessing. <clears throat> we light these candles, the candle of hope, of peace, of joy, and today, love, as a sign that we know blessings and we know waiting for a blessing to be felt and lived. We light this candle as a sign that we will seek a blessing It's time to go home. Let me invite you to stand and let's sing together. Child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthem sweet, while shepherds watch are keeping. This is his Christ the King. Who shepherds God and angels sing? Haste, haste to bring him home, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean a state where oxen has our feet? Good Christians fear for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him up, the babe, the son of man. King to own him, the King of 
King salvation bring with loving hearts and throne him. This is his Christ the King, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him home, the babe, the son of Mary. It is great to see so many of you here this morning. I know we've got a lot of folks who are sick right now and couldn't make it. A few announcements. First, our Blue Christmas or Longest Night service, as it's also called. Traditionally, we, it's had on the, uh, the first day of winter. will be this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock here in the Great Room. It's a service of hope and remembrance for whom the season is not always full of joy. So come and, if particularly if you're feeling low, come. And if you'd like to support people who are feeling low during the holidays, come. Or just come and be part of a great worship service Tuesday night. Here is the invitation card for the Christmas Eve service. You are invited. St. Andrew's United Methodist Church Christmas Eve celebration, December the 24th, which is next Friday evening. 6 o'clock, a gift of music, Gloria English. Gloria is going to play for about an hour. Begin, uh, the beginning of the service. I can't wait for that. Seven o'clock, the candlelight service, celebrating the night before the birth of Christ. The great room is going to be set with tables. There will be hot chocolate, hot cider, and cookies available. Family and friends are welcome. In fact, please invite them to come. And the service will be online for those who are not able to come in person. It'll be online. It'll also be recorded to be played later. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll make candles and communion supplies available in the church for those who want to come by and pick them up, or you can get your own if you're going to be at home and do it online. You can have your own communion supplies and candle for that service because you'll need both for that. Um, finally, we will. Have, somebody asked me, are we going to have church next Sunday because it's the day after Christmas? Yes, we will. We'll have our 11 o'clock service. I don't know whether your Sunday school class will be meeting or not. That's up to your Sunday school. But we will be having a worship service at 11 o'clock in here next Sunday, the day after Christmas. Moving on to joys and celebrations. The live nativity was a huge success this year. We were able to do it again. I think that's something we ought to show God appreciation for and show appreciation to all those who worked so hard to make it happen. We missed one shift out of four because of weather, and that's not too bad, honestly, all things considered. Uh, we had one warm night and one cool night, so it was uh, interesting. There are pictures on the monitor out in the gathering space. Uh, if you want any of those pictures, please make a note of the ones you'd like to have and let Elaine Jenkins know. She took all those pictures this year. Let's see. Uh, the United Methodist Women and our children's ministry held a Christmas party this past Tuesday night. We had a lot of kids, a lot of families. It was a wonderful celebration. So thanks to the United Methodist Women and those who work with our children's ministry for putting together a wonderful event for our children and their families. And then finally, the angel tree, from what I could tell, was a big success. How many families did we serve? Patty. What's the ballpark? Uh, we did roughly 18 families. Okay. Probably 50 families. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for your generosity in helping make Christmas better for a few families and a lot of kids. So God bless all of you for that. Moving on to our concerns, please lift up Linda Garrison and the family of Ed Garrison. Ed passed away Friday morning at the hospital. Ed had been struggling with COVID-19, so please pray for them. We're going to miss Ed. We're going to miss Ed. Ed was our photographer, among many other things, and uh, he will be very much missed. Linda is in quarantine still until Tuesday, but she appreciates your prayers, and I'm sure she would like uh, a phone call, and then she's going to be able to get out again after Tuesday. According to what she told me, the service for Ed will be sometime after the new year. It won't be until after the new year. Please pray for Jim Sawislow and his family. Jim's brother passed away unexpectedly the other morning. So prayers for them during a very difficult time. I see Jim is here this morning. Brother, we're praying for you. 
We have a number of people who are sick. Please continue to pray for Maggie Smale. Maggie is still in the intensive care unit at UNC Hospital. She is no longer COVID positive, so she no longer has the virus in her body, but now she's recovering from the damage that the virus did to her. So continue to pray for Maggie and for her family. Her mom is here this morning. I see you there, Ann. Um, Tina Garner had to go to the hospital yesterday, was very sick. Uh, but they were able to send her back home, treat her, and send her home, so we're grateful for that. We have had a lot of sickness in the church, as I mentioned earlier. There's a lot of upper respiratory stuff, which in a time of a respiratory pandemic is difficult <laughs> because when you start, your nose starts running or you get a headache and any of the slightest fever or the inclination, even for the vaccinated, is to wonder if you've got COVID. Um, so, but it's difficult. So I would encourage you, when you feel like that, stay in as much as you possibly can. I know you can't, everybody can't do that, but... Uh, just be careful. We've got a number of folks who are facing surgery soon. Bill Fuller's having some surgery coming up this next week. Vicki Graham's got surgery coming up at the beginning of the new year. We have others who are recovering from surgery. We want to pray for all of them. Continue to pray for our church, our empty staff positions, and the challenges we continue to have to face because of COVID-19. It, it never seems to end, and it's always something different. Are there any other concerns today you'd like to lift up? And please call these out loud, please, so I can hear them. Yes, Sally. Okay, so your niece's baby is in the NIC unit. Thank you. Yes. My neighbor's grandson, I looked out the window this morning. The EMS truck was there, so I ran over. And uh, she does not have COVID, but she is very, very ill. Okay. I don't know who talked to her. Her name is Francis. Okay, Artis' neighbor, Francis. Sam? Yes. Okay. Heather's friend, Jason, and his family. Jason has brain cancer and is being treated. Any others? Yes? Chris Ann Matthews. Chris Ann Matthews, thank you. We do have, uh, thank you for reminding me that I've had it in front of me. I just didn't say it. We have cancer patients in our church family, uh, in, our, in our congregation and family members. And one of the things I think we forget about cancer patients is not only are they having to deal with the treatments, which may be radiation, it may be chemotherapy, some have had surgery. They're also very vulnerable right now, even if they've had vaccinations. And in some cases, the vaccinations that they had because they had been having chemotherapy or they had it in the past, even people who had a cancer and treated a long time ago, the vaccinations don't take as well. So they're vulnerable. So pray for them, not only for their cancer, but for the fact that they're more vulnerable during this time of pandemic. Thank you for reminding me of that. Any others? Thank you again for your generosity in supporting the mission and ministry of St. Andrews United Methodist Church. If you'd like to give, there's a basket at the back. You can come by the church and put it in our secure mailbox, or for those online, you can give online at www.standrewsumc.org. It's an easy process, a green button at the top of our webpage that you can click on. It'll lead you through the process. Again, thank you so much for all that you do to support us and to keep us going, not only through the bad times, but through the good. Um, Gloria, are we all going to sing this song? No, this is, this is Harrison. Okay, this is Harrison. All right. I just have a song written down. Okay, Harrison, you come up and sing that. Actually, this is a song that I think many of us probably couldn't sing. It's very difficult. Oh, 
Wow, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I hate to have to follow that, actually. <laughs> that was outstanding. Thank you so much, both of you. That was powerful. Our scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read through verse 8. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Anne-Marie and I went out and got some food at Bojangles last week. We don't go inside restaurants, haven't since this started sat out in the parking lot, we're eating our food, and uh, a lady pulled up in the car beside us, and she was on her phone when she got out. She's really loud talking, and at first I thought she was talking to me, so I was a little alarmed because she sounded angry. I couldn't imagine what I'd done, but she got out of her car, and she was on her phone, and I heard her talking about somebody had broken into her mother's, her 78-year-old mother's car and stolen all of her Christmas presents that she had purchased. And she was, this woman was very upset. She said, what the blank is wrong with people? Somebody needs to find that guy and shoot him in the blankety blank. She was upset for her mother and how people can be like that. 
Christmas can have a negative effect on some people, without a doubt. Even though 90% of all Americans or Americans of all religious persuasions, including people who aren't Christians, celebrate Christmas, and even though Christianity is still the largest religious group in the nation, it's true that the religious aspect of it, the Jesus part of Christmas, seems to get forced further back out of focus every year. Back uh, 30 years ago, Dave Barry, comedian and humor writer, poked fun at all this and wrote the following about anti-Christian political correctness. He said, to avoid offending anybody, the school dropped religion altogether and started singing about the weather. At my son's school, they now hold the winter program in February and sing increasingly non-memorable songs such as Winter Wonderland, Frosty the Snowman, and believe it or not, Susie Snowflake, all of which is pretty funny because we live in Miami. A visitor from another planet would assume that the children belong to the Church of Meteorology. I know people who get tied up in knots over this kind of thing. They'll tell you that there's a war on Christmas. This is just an example of how Christians are being persecuted. One year it was the cups at Starbucks. How could they do this? How are they, why are they treating Christians this way? It's just another sign we live in a godless world and the second coming of Christ is near. The truth of the matter is, as for so-called persecution, none of us poor put upon American Christians here in the land of political correctness has yet shed blood for our faith. We're not persecuted. And when and if the day comes when we do get persecuted for our faith, we'll be in good company. Because you see Christians in many places in the world, even now today, if you lived in Kenya, if you lived in Sudan, if you lived in Iraq, if you lived in India, if you lived in Indonesia, Christians all around the world are in danger every day because of their faith. They do shed their blood. So changing the words of Christmas carols seems pretty trivial by comparison to me. The early church was oppressed, and yet we don't hear those believers complaining about how they're treated or threatening to sue because of the way they're treated. Peter wrote about this in 1 Peter 4. He said, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. You hear what he's saying? Christians should expect to be persecuted. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So instead of getting angry when somebody won't say Merry Christmas to you in a store, maybe you should rejoice, according to Peter. Every year, though, there are crusaders out there trying to save Christmas for Christians. A few years ago, Focus on the Family got in on the crusade. They compiled, they had a list that you could go to online and find it. They compiled a list of stores out there and ranked them by how explicitly they mentioned Christmas in their marketing. So they looked at all their ads, and they went in the stores, and if they didn't mention Christmas, they got low marks on the website. And Focus on the Family said, don't go shop at those stores. They're not mentioning Christmas. So Walmart and Sam's Club were at the very top for keeping Merry Christmas in their advertising. I guess the long hours that Walmart and Sam's employees have to work during this season is okay as long as they say Merry Christmas every time you come in the store. Dick's Sporting Goods and Barnes and Noble were on the naughty list because they had joined the dark side and were now saying Happy Holidays to people. Which strikes me as odd. We often hear that, even from Christians, that Christmas is too commercialized and yet the same people who say it's too commercialized apparently want it to be used as a marketing tool to sell things at Christmas. That seems a little odd to me. Several years ago, former vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin came out with a book on this very subject called Good Tidings and Great Joy, Protecting the Heart of Christmas. Guess when the book came out? During Christmas, so that she would sell more copies of it. Personally, I don't want some tired, overworked cashier to be forced against her will to have to say Merry Christmas to me. I don't particularly want the birth of my Savior to be used as a marketing tool more than it already is to get me to spend more money than I'm already spending. I sound pretty grinchy this morning, don't I? We saw The Grinch two weeks ago during our family movie night. It's a great movie. It has a great message. You can actually find the teleplay online. I want to read a little bit of it to you. I think the Grinch is an interesting character to talk about. Every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. 
But the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas, the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one knows quite the reason. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm, lighted windows below in their town, for he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a holly Who wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas, it's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming, I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming. For tomorrow I know all the Who girls and boys will wake bright and early, they'll rush for their toys, and then, oh, the noise. Oh, the noise, 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 noise. There's one thing I hate, all the noise, noise, noise. They'll stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'll stand hand in hand, and those who's will start singing. And they'll sing, and they'll sing, and they'll sing, 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 sing. And the more the Grinch thought of this who Christmas sing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years, I put up with it now. I must stop Christmas from coming, but how? Then he got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do, the Grinch laughed in his throat. I'll make a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat. And he did that. This is stop number one, the old Grinchy Claus hissed. And he climbed on the roof, empty bags in his fist. And he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch. But if Santa could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once for a minute or two. Then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue where the little who stockings hung all in a row. These stockings, he grinched, are the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant around the whole room and he took every present. It was a quarter of dawn, all the who's still abed, all the who's still a snooze when he packed up his sled, packed up their presents, their ribbons, their wrappings, their snoof and their fuzzles, their tringlers and trappings. 10,000 feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. Poo poo to the who's, he was grinchily humming. They're founding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up, and I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open for a minute or two, and then the who's down in Whoville will all cry boo hoo. <laughs> That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. He paused, and the Grinch put a hand to his ear. Why is Christmas so difficult? Why has it become so much more difficult now than it was 20 years ago, 25 years ago? Why is there so much spirit of the Grinch in our world today? The scripture lesson today is actually the lesson that you're supposed to read on Epiphany, the second Sunday after Christmas. But I wanted to read it today because King Herod is probably the greatest Grinch in all of scripture. He outgrinches the Grinch. Herod, in fact, makes the Grinch look like a rank amateur. In the text, we read that King Herod ruled over Judea when Jesus was born. He called himself Herod the Great, and in some ways, he was a great king. He doubled the size of the temple. He built numerous palaces and fortifications. He kept the nation at peace with its neighbors. And when famine devastated the land, he purchased food for his starving people with money from his own treasury out of his own pocket. Those are all wonderful things to do. He sounds like such a good guy. So why was he upset, as we read, about a baby being born in Bethlehem? Well, Herod had a darker side. The same man who had done so much for his nation had a reputation for jealously protecting his power. Listen to some of the things that he did. When his 16-year-old brother-in-law tried to make a name for himself, Herod playfully held the boy's head underwater until he drowned. Years later, one of his many wives became involved in a plot to have her family rise to power, and even though he loved this wife deeply, he had her executed. A couple of years before he died, he heard rumors that two of his sons were engaged in a plot to get rid of him, so he promptly had both of his sons killed. After hearing about that last incident, the Roman Emperor Augustus commented, it is safer to be Herod's pig 
than Herod's son. And it's true. He was the Saddam Hussein of his day. His primary motivation in life was to control his world. He used his power not only for good, but also to bend the world to his will. Anything or anybody who got in Herod's way was an obstacle that he had to remove. So Herod's court astrologers and priests had told him that the stars were revealing that an even greater king than he was about to come into the world, one before whom the whole world would ultimately bow. And that terrified him. And based on what he did after that, I think he probably understood who Jesus is better than many Christians do. Our old Christmas carols get it right, though. Listen to these lyrics. We just sang this one. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. They understood who he was. Or how about this one? Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Our hymns get it right. We understand when we sing who Jesus is, the message in those songs. And he's a king whose mandate is not to use violence like Herod to get his way, not to force people, but to use love to persuade so that sinners can be reconciled and people can be reconciled to God. That kind of king deserves our loyalty. We ought to put aside all other allegiances to follow him. When we walk through the doors of this building, we're not Republicans. We're not Democrats. We're not even Americans. We're Christians. We can be those other things when we walk back outside. In here, we're Christians. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. No other allegiance is above that. No earthly ruler will ever warrant the devotion that we should give Christ. Compared to him, all earthly powers are second rate. Herod understood all of this. So he tried to get the location of this newborn king from the wise man, not to worship him, which is, he was lying to them about that. He had no intention of bowing down to anybody. But as we read later in the same chapter of Matthew, he wanted the baby hunted down and killed. And remember what he did. He had his soldiers go down to the area where Jesus lived and they killed all the baby boys that were that age, which is why Mary and Joseph had to leave with Jesus and go to Egypt. Talk about wanting to put an end to Christmas. He wanted to put an end to Christmas by killing Christ. That's a little bit worse than what the Grinch had in mind. The Grinch just couldn't stand all the celebration and the joy and the sharing, and he went down into Whoville, and he stole all the Christmas presents, and he stole all the decorations... And he stole all the food. Sometimes I wonder if Christians understand the true nature of Jesus less than Christ's enemies do. Sometimes they seem to get it better than we do. We look around us and we see a world that on the surface appears to have not changed very much since Jesus' day. We still have wars and rumors of wars and violence and all kinds of terrible things happening. And folks look out and they say, some Messiah Jesus was. I thought he was supposed to do something about all this. Why are we still killing each other? Why are people still suffering? Why is there so much pain? Why is there so little faith? That gets inside Christians too, and so many of us just half-heartedly follow him. Why do we follow Jesus? Maybe because it's the socially acceptable thing to do in our community. Maybe because we want our kids to learn moral values and they're not getting them in school. Maybe because we feel guilty. And that's why we go, because our family always did. And if we don't go, we feel guilty. Any reason other than the one of worshiping and loving Christ. But Christ, our King, rules us from the inside out or not at all. He rules through love and persuasion, not through force and coercion. And the world doesn't comprehend that kind of rule. And many Christians don't, because we tend to want something to be done right now. We want what we want, and we want it now, and if people have to be made to do what we want, that's okay. So we want laws to be passed. We want people to have to behave like Christians. So we we want to get laws passed that make everybody behave like Christians. You know, something blood-chilling that I heard last month, General Michael Flynn, former uh, presidential advisor, at a speech he said, we're one nation under God, so we should have one religion. 
I guess he didn't understand the Constitution and the Second Amendment and that part about no religion being established. And I was wondering, how does he intend to have one religion? And I'm sure he meant Christianity. Are you going to outlaw the other religions? Are you going to make people who aren't Christians get on a boat and go or plane and leave the country? Why would you want to make everybody be Christians? Because we want people to be compelled to do what we want them to do. It's a lot of work to persuade people, isn't it? It's a lot less work to just make them do it, to twist their arm behind their back. I guess this kind of lies behind my own indifference about whether stores say Merry Christmas to me or not. I don't want to be manipulated with religious talk from anybody, honestly. If I'm not right on the inside, then all the pious sounding language in the world is not going to make a difference to me, nor to anybody else. If you're not right on the inside, somebody saying Merry Christmas to you is not going to make you go become a Christian. You know who can change the human heart? Jesus Christ. Period. Jesus can make us right inside, and that makes him infinitely more powerful than any human ruler. Jesus can heal our hearts. Jesus can repair our damaged attitudes and our twisted desires. Jesus can give us hope. Jesus can help us to love each other better. And when Jesus is at work in us, we can change. We can be different. And then the world can change because the world's not going to change until we change. We can overcome the desire to get even when we've been harmed. Herod would never have understood not getting revenge because his heart wasn't changed. We can get past, with Jesus' help, a desire to prosper at the expense of others. Herod would never have understood that because to him people were expendable. They were obstacles. I can either use them to get what I want or they get in my way and I get rid of them. That's the way of the world. For a Christian, no human being is a means to an end. We should never look at a person and figure out how we're going to use them to get what we want or how they're an obstacle that has to be removed if we can't get what we want. How different things might be in this world if those of us who follow to claim Jesus truly lived the way that Jesus has called us to live. You see, a changed heart is more powerful than any human weapon. Empires can be toppled permanently by faith, hope, and love. The Roman Empire was overcome not by outside enemies, but by the power of Jesus Christ. If your enemy can become your friend, guess what? You've conquered him. Herod understood fully what he was up against. That's why he was so scared. That's why he wanted this new king to die. Herod knew he could never persuade people to be loyal to him. He could only threaten them. But this king was going to be able to change people's hearts. So our question this and every day is how to have a changed heart. Herod's heart never changed. He died that way. But now the Grinch, that's a different story. That's a noise grin, the Grinch, that I simply must hear. He paused and the Grinch put a hand to his ear. And he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low and then it started to grow. But this sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded glad. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or the other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. He puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. And then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas perhaps means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And then the true meaning of Christmas came through, and the Grinch found the strength of ten Grinches plus two. And now that his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light. With a smile to his soul, he descended Mount Crumpet, cheerily blowing hoo-hoo on his trumpet. He rode into Whoville. He brought back the toys. He brought back the floof to the Who girls and boys. He brought back their snoof and their tringlers and fuzzles, brought back their pantukas, their dafflers and wuzzles. He brought everything back, all the food for the feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. Welcome Christmas. Bring your cheer. Cheer to all of you far and near. Did you notice that the Grinch didn't change his own heart? 
the change came from outside him. Only when he saw the who's celebrating without all the presence, without their tree, was a fundamental truth revealed to him. Maybe Christmas doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas means a little bit more. So the next time you're upset that your favorite store won't say Merry Christmas to you, remember that line. Maybe Christmas doesn't come from a store. The grace and gratitude that people of true faith express despite their circumstances is a powerful witness to the reality and the goodness of God. The Grinch was being evangelized by the Who's, and he didn't even know it. Now, folks, I'm not naive. I know how the Grinch stole Christmas is not a Christian story. It could just as well have been called how the Grinch stole Hanukkah or how the Grinch stole Ramadan. But it illustrates my point today. A changed heart can change everything. From that day forward, the Grinch was a changed man or a changed Grinch, I suppose. Let me say it again. The changed heart is not some kind of self-help program that you can engage in. Salvation is a gift. It's not the result of hard work. And too many of us don't understand that. We think we have to work hard for it. We think that coming to church and reading the Bible and paying our tithe and helping the poor in the community is somehow going to save us. And all of those are really good things. And even if your heart is not right yet, doing things like that can put you in a position to have your heart be changed. They can get you ready. But a changed heart is a gift received by faith. It's not something you earn by good deeds. And all we poor self-centered Grinches can do is watch and wait and hope for that moment when God will reveal himself to us and we too have that breakthrough and finally understand the truth. We just have to wait and be ready for that time when God is going to make our heart grow three sizes. And God gives himself to us all the time in so many ways, if only we had the eyes to see. It's simple, friends. We can be open to the truth. We can always be looking for goodness and hoping for goodness, preparing for it to enter our heart and change us from the inside. Or we can take the route of Herod. We can deny the truth by trying to grab on and control everything and everybody in our life. The choice is ours this Christmas, every Christmas, and every day, whether we think we know Jesus already or not. So this Christmas and every day, may we all be grinched and come to know that Christmas Day is in our grasp. So long as we have hands to clasp, Christmas Day will always be just as long as we have we. Welcome Christmas while we stand heart to heart and hand in hand. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let's stand and sing. From the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. Ye who sang creation's story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Shepherds in the field abiding, Watching all your flocks by night, God with us is still residing. Yonder shines the infant light. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Sages, leave your contemplations. Brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desert of nations. Ye have seen his natal star. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. 
Saints before the ultimate day, watching on in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending, in his temple shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Amen. You may be seated. Based on just the fact that we are here in worship, each one of us has a lot that we can be grateful for because there are people who would like to be here but can't. There are people who simply can't. There are people who don't want to be here, and that's sad too. So we have a lot to be grateful for, and yet there are many people for whom gratitude and joy seem distant, and their pain seems to be amplified in a season when everybody else seems to be happy. So this morning I want us to remember those for whom life is hard at Christmas. And I pray that they know that we love them and that even more God loves them. So I'm going to say a few sentences here and at the end of this sentence I'm going to ask for you to respond. I will say Jesus and then when I say Jesus you're going to say give us loving hearts. So we're going to practice. Jesus, let us pray. Almighty God, today we are reminded of all the Grinches and Herods of this world. Jesus, we're reminded of suffering children, those who are hungry, those who are sick or hurt, those who are afraid, and God forbid, those who are unwanted or neglected or abused. Jesus, we're reminded of the elderly or the disabled who can't get up, can't get out, can't do for themselves as they once did or have always wanted to. Jesus, Christmas will be a time of sadness for those separated from their loved ones, such as refugees or our overseas military personnel or those who have to travel for work. Jesus, Christmas will be hard for families separated through divorce this year. Jesus, Christmas will be hard, so hard, for those who have lost a loved one or a close friend to death. Jesus, Christmas will be hard for those who are very sick and for those who care for them. Jesus, dear God, in the midst of our own challenges to experience the joy of this season, give us loving hearts to help our neighbors, for in reaching out in love, we are able to remember and experience again the true spirit of Christmas. Through the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let me invite you to stand. We're going to sing, and after we sing, then you're going to be able to greet each other and pass on the peace of Christ. So let's stand up one last time.
Take a moment now and greet each other in Jesus' name and pass on the peace of Jesus Christ to your friends and neighbors. Good, that's good. A lot of people don't understand that. Folks, for our closing today, it's sort of a cross between an affirmation of faith and a benediction. The first part of it, you'll have an opportunity to respond. I'm going to have three if you choose statements. And if you choose at the end of the statement, then you say, I so choose. So let's practice that. If you choose to answer that way, I so choose. You don't have to answer it all if you don't feel that way. If you choose, you can be an instrument of goodness in this world. If you choose, you can be a voice of hope and optimism for the people around you. If you choose, you can fight against the anxiety that freezes the hearts of so many. The way we live into the possibilities of Christmas is our choice to make. The beauty is that we don't have to live out that choice by only our own strength. So go now with God, who empowers our hopes and quiets our fears, always and everywhere. And the people of God said, Amen.